Hi, my name is Andy Hamer. I work with Bentley as a UK uh, account manager for the power and energy sector. I've been asked today to talk to you about digital twins in uh, a matter of 15 minutes. And um, so I'm going to be giving you a very high level overview of that. I'm going to cover off. Let's. I'm going to cover off in the agenda a little bit about me, some of the myths, the business case and the evolution. So a little bit about me, I've got 30 years of experience in disruptive technology across multiple sectors. Um, I've got 10 years experience here in the built environment and inf infrastructure sector, working across the full building life cycle. I certified myself as a BIM information manager. and I have written a number of books and white papers on asset management. And just to give some background, when I started in work, we had lease lines at 2.8. We had no internet and no mobile phones and no video desktop calling. Um, a big change to what we see today and many of the disruptive technologies I was involved in earlier have laid the foundation for many of the things that we can do today. Um, I think one of the things we need to understand is, um, is evolve or die. Uh, and I'll cover that off a little bit, the difference between what I see as revolution and evolution later on. So in terms of a digital twin, um, there is a definition, which is the one that you can see in front of you here. Um, Bentley is part of the Digital Twin Consortium. Um, there is no standard, but let's, let's clear that one away from a myth perspective. And there could be more than one digital twin working in your environment. Couple of key things, um, you know, the myth is you can sort of take it out of a box, plug it in, in the power and the internet and, and away it goes. And it's some sort of big bang approach. Not going to happen. Digital transformation and digital twins is a journey. It is all about finding the criticalities in your assets. Think about that, the criticality in your assets. What asset in your facility be it an oil refinery, be a power station, be a hospital, uh, be a school or whatever. What is the criticality? What's the asset that if it stops working, it brings it all to a halt that has both financial, economic and social consequences. And that's the important thing. When you're looking at this digital twin, looking at digital transformation, it is looking at our criticalities in the assets. Now, the other the other myth that tends to get called out is that you get a digital twin and all the other solutions you've invested in over the last 10, 15 years are all going to be superseded. Incorrect. It's not to say that the Trump implementing a digital twin over a period of time, these may be naturally obsolete. But the reality with the digital twin is what we're trying to do is surface, socialize, all that um, silo data that you have in your organization and provide a, a way of aggregating it. The story goes, and I can't remember which management consultancy actually said it, but it's something like uh, only 10% of the data that we collect, no, 10% of the data we collect, we actually use in, in, in our decision making. So imagine a situation where all of that data from all those different silos, when we work out which one's the, the most accurate and up to date, can actually uh, bring together and provide you with full knowledge on the way your building is operated. So we're not going to get rid of all your existing solutions. Let's get right one out of the way. Um, it, the other thing is that it, it, it is a journey. Um, I will reiterate this numerous times. It's a journey. You know, it's what we need to do is to look at criticality, prove it um, and then prove big and then scale. It'll become obvious then. So that's that's you know quite important. So I've been working mainly in the utility sector, uh, energy utility sector, and um, the benefits of seeing a digital twin for an operational perspective are actually quite significant. Now, in the energy sector in the UK and probably in elsewhere. The situation is it's highly regulated. Uh, planning times are long. 
uh, predictability in terms of consumption, so on and so forth. Now, with the green agenda, with deregulation, and with the barriers of entry now being lowered into this market, we have new players coming in who can operate their facilities in a much more efficient manner because they're starting from a greenfield site. They're putting, you know, things like digital twins in, they're putting asset management in. They're doing all of these things to enable them to to really leverage the value of their investment, reduce costs, increase predictability in terms of maintenance and things like that. And that's quite crucial. <clears throat> the only example I can think of that where the parallel between the energy sector would be the airline sector, which was highly regulated uh, when I first started traveling, uh, owned by all the different governments. And when it was deregulated, you found all these low cost carriers coming in, buying or leasing the, the latest planes, the most fuel efficient, most up to date, putting all the systems in place that made them highly efficient, leveraging that investment they got and making sure that they could load those planes at a much higher level. So I think I think, you know, that's, that's it's quite important to understand that. And what we're doing here with this digital twin is integrating data and people. Better informed people make better decisions. Now, I think the other thing I need to sort of point out here in some respects is I think we can we can probably visualize in our minds many of the things we know we're going to get out of putting a digital planet or implementing a digital twin. But it was interesting, I was talking to a facilities manager, of one of our largest universities in the UK, uh, on their sort of road on the digital twin journey. And he said that to me that it wasn't the information, the value came from what he thought, knew he was going to get out of it. Actually, it was the real value, the real opportunity in terms of operational understanding of their facilities and their campus was the things that they couldn't have known until that data was surfaced, aggregated and presented in a way um, that could be used. Um, another one, um, I was talking to a, a big uh, investor of property in, in, in London and using digital twin technology, he believed that he could, they could leverage another 10% uh, on the value of their of their real estate come that, when they wanted to sell it because they'd have all the information and documents available to make that sale go through quicker. Now that's leveraging on a five billion pound uh, real estate uh, estate, uh, it's 500 million. So that's some of the things that you, you know you, we can see we can get out of it. But also means in socializing that data means, you know, example, if you were running a wind farm in the North Sea, the weather's unpredictable. So if you find you've got a fault, you want to make sure that when that person goes out to that wind farm, into that particular turbine, they've actually got what's necessary. So they're going into the systems. The system says it's a 2222. And when they get out there, you know, they're two hour journey out to offshore, get there get onto the tower, find it's a 44-44, we've wasted a lot of money. Um, so, you know, th there's, there's some serious advantage to socialising this data and making use of it. And in some respects, I think what we, we can start to see with digital twins, we're actually starting to see for the first time, probably a real understanding of the operational cost for running a facility. Now, I know many of you in the audience uh, are on the asset owner side of it or on operator side of things. But actually in reality, digital twins play a significant part uh, in digital delivery. And from a project delivery side, um, if you want a good fungally functional operational digital twin, then for refurbs and for uh, new builds, it's important that um, as you as an owner operator impose onto that supply chain um, and expect exact specification of exactly what it is you want in terms of data and document for the assets that you're managing and the individual assets um, because if you expect the supply chain to deliver it uh, trust me they won't they will deliver information they think you want and they will use the information and the processes to deliver between their supply partners that facility, but they may not necessarily deliver that information. Um, I'll just sort of an example of uh, a, a sort of a, a refurbed 
uh, BIM project or retrospective BIM project was I was working with General Motors in the States uh, um, some five years ago and they were looking at uh, getting collecting asset data and they decided they wanted 200 pieces of data for every one of their assets in one of their existing plants and um, I asked the why question and uh, they looked at me and I said do you really want 200? Yeah we want 200. Well there's a cost to collect and add information. Okay so why didn't go away and think about it? They went away and thought about it and said, actually, we'll have 20. We'll get 20 pieces of data for every asset and admitted that when that asset was replaced, then they would get the full uh, amount of portfolio of information need from an operational perspective. So it's critical whether you're doing new builds and refurbs that the delivery side of things is doing it in a way and in a manner that will help you to operate that building. That's not to say there's not benefits um, from an operational perspective because obviously there is. So moving swiftly on. So it's sort of from a critical business side of things, um, I've said before, yes, it's easy in some respects if you can go down the Greenfield site because there's nothing there. Uh, you can ensure that all the BIM standards uh, that are available uh, will deliver that. Um, but there are significant benefits as we've already, I've already mentioned in aggregating and servicing that silo data. And, you know, that really does give us a situation where we can really see how it's, it's operating. We can then look at it from the perspective of targeted maintenance. You know, you might have a valve or a pump that's using different systems. Currently, the O&M manual says um, go and look at it every three months, irrespective of, uh, and you have no way of monitoring it at this point. But if you had a way of monitoring it and you knew what service it was, it was actually involved in in that particular circuit, you could then say, well, actually that one, or I only need to go every six months, that one I need to go every month because that's on a critical part of the, the business. So digital twins enable us to surface that information, enable us to, to look at improving asset utility, uh, you know, making sure we, you know, we've got reliance with services available and and uh, you know we, we, we're managing our assets in a way that they don't break down when we don't in, in a way we can't deal with it and, and also um, it actually enables us to do proper capex investment because we can look at total life cycle costing we can look at the cost of an item that we put in and we can look at the cost of that item when it's been uh, it's been utilized in operations and work out whether the 25 pound pump visa 50 pound pump which one actually in total life cycle costing actually benefits you and actually delivers a better value product so let's go back over it um digital twins do provide significant benefits to everybody i'll just show you uh, some examples of that and um, there's here three that i'm able to share with you um in addition to that, I am working with a number of uh, large uh, communications operators that are looking at digital twins for the whole of their mass network. Uh, we're talking, you know, tens of thousands. I'm also uh, in the process of uh, talking with a number of network operators in the utilities market about their pylons and digital twins for that, um, all in, a, in an effort to reduce costs and maximise investments. So to finish off in some respects, I said I'd start with my view of revolution and evolution. You need to be getting involved in digital twins today. It's an and make sure it's evolutionary because you're to some extent in control of it. If you don't do it now and you don't get involved in it and you don't start thinking about it now, it becomes revolutionary. You become reactive and you're playing a game of catch up with your competitors. Um, it, 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 this technology that we're talking about, yes, it's digital twins, but in reality, twins have been around for a very long time. Go back as far as Stonehenge, they go back as far as the Greeks um, with a, a device that looked at the stars and computed. We've got Victorians who invented the uh, tide, um, uh, so with the ships could come in out of ports in a in a, a known manner to for supply chains we've got nasa using digital twins 
in in the sixties and seventies on the Apollo um, on the Apollo missions. And the other thing is, actually, in reality, think about it. There is a digital twin that you probably use every day, either to navigate, to find a restaurant, to find some piece of news, and and even the traffic. It's called Google. Google is a digital twin, layers and layers of data um, on top of each other in a way that's accessible. And that's exactly what a digital twin could do for your facility. If you want to talk to me further about this, I'm more than happy to do that. You can see my 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 uh, my details. Um, on coming up. Yep, there's my details. I'm Andy Hamer. I'm an account manager with Bentley. Um, there's my email address, my telephone number, my LinkedIn. Please feel free to uh, have a chat with me. I'm more than happy to to discuss any digital twin uh, conversation you want. Thanks for your time and catch you later.